Hello everyone, it's Mr. Nobody, and I'm bringing you another literature reading today. You have to forgive me, I seem to have lost my mic, I can't find it today for some reason, so I'm just going to use the onboard audio. Today I'm going to do a little reading from the Screwtape Letters. It's been read, of course, by many actors and readers much greater than myself, but it's a, a book that I've always enjoyed for a long time. Uh, it's been turned into a play. It's a lot of fun by C.S. Lewis, uh, one of his books that really helped propel him to uh, general fame. So, if you don't know the premise of this book, it is a series of letters written by um, <laughs> Screwtape to his nephew Wormwood, who is a junior demon trying to ruin a young man's life, um, and uh, Screwtape is giving him lots of advice. Uh, it, it does take place uh, in England and London during the Blitz, just for, for some historical context of, of um, when it happened. So, let's begin. Oh, and I'm going to just leap ahead and read a couple chapters that I thought are relevant. I feel like um, maybe the current social situations, things like social media, pressures that I myself feel and experience are the ones that brought these to my mind that make me want to read these two chapters in particular. My dear Wormwood, everything is clearly going very well. I'm especially glad to hear that the two new friends... Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I meant to read the chapter before that. <laughs> <clears throat> My dear Wormwood, I was delighted to hear from Triptwees that your patient has made some very desirable new acquaintances, and you seem to have used this event in a very promising manner. I gather that the married, middle-aged couple who called at his office are just the sort of people we want him to know. Rich, smart, superficially intellectual, and brightly skeptical about everything in the world. I gather they even vaguely pacifist, not on moral grounds, but from an ingrained habit of belittling anything that concerns the great mass of their fellow men, and from a dash of purely fashionable literary communism. This is excellent. You seem to have made good use of all his social, sexual, and intellectual vanity. Tell me more. Did he commit himself deeply? I don't mean in words. There's a subtle play of looks and tones and laughs by which a mortal can imply that he's of the same party to those whom he is speaking. That is the kind of betrayal you should specially encourage, because the man does not fully realize it himself, and by the time he does, you'll have made withdrawal difficult. No doubt he must very soon realize that his own faith is in direct opposition to the assumptions on which all the conversation of his new friends is based. I don't think that matters much, provided that you persuade him to postpone any open acknowledgement of the fact. And this, with the aid of shame, pride, modesty, and vanity, will be easy to do. As long as the postponement lasts, he'll be in a false position. He'll be silent when he ought to speak and laugh when he ought to be silent. He'll assume, at first only by his manner, but presently by his words, all sorts of cynical and skeptical attitudes which are not really his. But if you play him well, they may become his. All mortals tend to turn into the thing they're pretending to be. This is elementary. The real question is how to prepare for the enemy's counterattack. The first thing is to delay as long as possible the moment at which he realizes this new pleasure as a temptation. Since the enemy's servants have been preaching about the world as one of the great standard temptations for 2,000 years, this might seem a difficult thing to do. But fortunately, they've said very little about it for the last few decades. In modern Christian writings, though I see much, indeed more than I like, about mammon, I see few of the old warnings about worldly vanities, the choice of friends, and the value of time. All that, your patient would probably classify as fundamentalism. And may I remark in passing that the value we've given to that word is one of the really solid triumphs of the last hundred years. By it we rescue annually, annually thousands of humans from temperance, chastity, and sobriety of life. Sooner or later, however, the real nature of his new friends must become clear to him, and then your tactics must depend on the patient's intelligence. If he's a big enough fool, you can get him to realize the character of his friends only while they're absent. Their presence can be made to sweep away all criticism. 
If this succeeds, he can be induced to live, as I have known many humans to live, for quite long periods, two parallel lives. He will not only appear to be, but will actually be a different man in each of the circles he frequents. Failing this, there is a subtler and more entertaining method. <laughs> he can be made to take a positive pleasure in the perception that the two sides of his life are inconsistent. This is done by exploiting his vanity. He can be taught to enjoy kneeling beside the grocer on Sunday, just because he remembers that the grocer could not possibly understand the urbane and mocking world which he inhabited on Sun Saturday evening, and contrarywise to enjoy the bodily and blasphemy over the coffee with these admirable friends, all the more because he's aware of a deeper spiritual world within him that they cannot understand. You see the idea. The worldly friends touch him on one side and the grocer on the other, and he is the complete, balanced, complex man who sees round them all, thus while being permanently treacher treacherous to at least two sets of people, he will feel instead of shame a continual undercurrent of self-satisfaction. Finally, if all else fails, you can persuade him, in defiance of conscience, to continue the new acquaintances on the ground that he is in some unspecified way, doing these people good by the mere fact of drinking their cocktails and laughing at their jokes, and that to cease to do so would be priggish, intolerant, and of course puritanical. Meanwhile, he will of course take the obvious precaution of seeing that this new development induces him to spend more than he can afford, and to neglect his work and his mother. Her jealousy and alarm, and his increasing evasiveness or rudeness, will be invaluable for the aggravation of the domestic tension. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape. I'm going to skip ahead a chapter two. Chapter twelve. My dear Wormwood, Obviously, you're making excellent progress. My only fear is lest in attempting to hurry the patient, you awaken him to any sense of his real position. For you and I, who see what that position as it really is, you must never forget how totally different it ought to appear to him. We know that we have introduced a change of direction in his course, which is already carrying him out of his orbit around the enemy. But he must be made to imagine all the choices which have affected this change, of course, are trivial and revocable. He must not be allowed to suspect that he is now, however, slowly heading right away from the sun on a line that will carry him into the cold and dark of utmost space. For this reason, I am almost glad to hear that he's still a churchgoer and a communicant. I know there are dangers in this, but anything is better than that he should realize the break he has made with the first months of his Christian life. As long as he retains externally the habits of a Christian, he can still be made to think of himself as one who has adopted a few new friends and amusement, but whose spiritual state is much the same as it was six weeks ago. And while he thinks that, we do not have to contend with the explicit repentance of a definite, fully recognized sin, but only with this vague, though uneasy feeling that he hasn't been doing very well lately. This dim uneasiness needs careful handling. If it gets too strong, it may wake him up and spoil the whole game. On the other hand, if you suppress it entirely, which, by the by, the enemy will probably not allow you to do, we lose an element in the situation which can be turned to good account. Such a feeling is allowed to live, but not allowed to become irresistible and flower into real repentance. It has one invaluable tendency. It increases the patient's reluctance to think about the enemy. All humans at nearly all times have some such reluctance, but when thinking of him involves facing and intensifying a whole vague cloud of half-conscious guilt, this reluctance is increased tenfold. They hate every idea that suggests him, just as men in financial embarrassment hate the very sight of a bank book. In this state, your patient will not omit, but he will increasingly dislike his religious duties. He will think about them as little as he feels he decently can beforehand, and forget them as soon as possible when they're over. A few weeks ago, you had to tempt him to unreality and inattention in his prayers, but now you'll find him opening his arms to you and almost begging you to distract his purpose and benumb his heart. He'll want his prayers to be unreal, for he will dread nothing so much as effective contact with the enemy. His aim will be to let sleeping worms lie. As this condition becomes more fully established, 
you'll be gradually freed from the tiresome business of providing pleasures of temptations. As the uneasiness and his reluctance to face it cut him off more and more from all real happiness, and his habit renders the pleasures of vanity and excitement and flippancy at once less pleasant and harder to forgo, for that is what habit fortunately does to a pleasure, you'll find that anything or nothing is sufficient to attract his wandering attention. He will no longer need a good book, which he really likes, to keep him from his prayers or his work or his sleep. A column of advertisements in yesterday's paper will do. You can make him waste his time, not only in conversation he enjoys with people whom he likes, but also in conversations with those he cares nothing about, on subjects that bore him. You can make him do nothing at all for long periods. You can keep him up late at night, not roistering, but staring at a dead fire in a cold room. All the healthy and outgoing activities which we want him to avoid can be inhibited and nothing given in return. So at last he may say, as one of my own patients said on his arrival down here, down here, I see now that I have spent most of my life in doing neither what I ought nor what I liked. The Christians describe the enemy as one without whom nothing is strong, and nothing is very strong, strong enough to steal away a man's best years, not in sweet sins, but in a dreary flickering of the mind over it knows not what and knows not why, in the gratification of curiosities so feeble the man is only half aware of them, in drumming of fingers and kicking of heels and whistling tunes he does not like, or in the long dim labyrinth of reveries that have not even lust or ambition to give them a relish, but which, once chance association has started them, the creature's too weak and fuddled to shake off. Or, were it today, Possibly the internet doom scrolling, maybe even just a little bit of social media, a bit of twittering. You will say that those are very small sins, and doubtless, like all young tempters, you'd be anxious to be able to report spectacular wit wickednesses. But do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy. It does not matter how small the sins are provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Murder's no better than cards, if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape. Now the final chapter I'm going to read, chapter 13. My dear Wormwood, it seems to me that you take a great many pages to tell a very simple story. The long and the short of it is that you will let the man slip through your fingers. The situation's very grave, and I really see no reason why I should try to shield you from the consequences of your inefficiency. A repentance and renewal of what the other side call grace on the scale which you describe as a defeat of the first order. It amounts to a second conversion, probably on a deeper level than the first. As you ought to have known, the asphyxiating cloud which prevented your attacking the patient on his walk back from the old mill is a well-known phenomenon. It is the enemy's most barbarous weapon, and generally appears when he's directly present to the patient, under certain modes not yet fully classified. Some humans are permanently surrounded by it and therefore inaccessible to us. And now for your blunders. On your own showing, you first of all allowed the patient to read a book he really enjoyed, because he enjoyed it, not in order to make clever remarks about it to his new friends. In the second place, you allowed him to walk down to the old mill and have tea there, a walk through country he really likes and taken alone. In other words, you allowed him two real positive pleasures. Were you so ignorant as to not see the danger of this? The characteristic of pains and pleasures is that they are unmistakably real, and therefore, as far as they go, give the man who feels them a touchstone with reality. Thus, if you had been trying to damn your man by the romantic method, by making him a kind of child herald or, or worther submerged in self-pity for imaginary distresses, you would try to protect him at all costs from any real pain, because of course five minutes genuine toothache would reveal the romantic sorrows for the nonsense they were and unmask your whole stratagem. But you were trying to damn your patient by the world. That is, by palming off vanity, bustle, irony, and expensive tedium as pleasures. 
How can you have failed to see that a real pleasure was the last thing you ought to have let him meet? Didn't you foresee that it would just kill by contrast all the trumpery which you've been so laboriously teaching him to value? And that the sort of pleasure which the book and the walk gave him was the most dangerous of all? that would peel off from his sensibility the kind of crust you have been forming on it and make him feel that he was coming home, recovering himself. As a preliminary to detaching him from the enemy, you wanted to detach him from himself and had made some progress in doing so. Now all that is undone. Of course I know that the enemy also wants to detach men from themselves, but in a different way. Remember always that he really likes the little vermin, and sets an absurd value on the distinctiveness of every one of them. When he talks of their losing their selves, he means only abandoning the clamor of self-will. Once they've done that, he really gives them back all of their personality, and boasts, I'm afraid sincerely, that when they're wholly his, they will be more themselves than ever. <sighs> Hence, while he is delighted to see them sacrificing even their innocent wills to his, he hates to see them drifting away from their own nature for any other reason. And we should always encourage them to do so. The deepest likings of and impulses of any man are the raw material, the starting point with which the enemy has furnished him. To get him away from those is therefore always a point gained. Even in things indifferent, it is always desirable to substitute the standards of the world, or convention, or fashion, for a human's own real likings and dislikings. I myself would carry this very far. I would make it a rule to eradicate from my patient any strong personal taste which is not actually a sin, even if it's something quite trivial, such as a fondness for county cricket, or collecting stamps, or drinking cocoa. Such things, I grant you, have nothing of virtue in them, but there's a sort of innocence and humility and self-forgetfulness about them which I distrust. The man who truly and disinterestedly enjoys any one thing in the world for its own sake and without caring twopence about what another, other people say about it is by that very fact forearmed against some of our subtlest modes of attack. You should always try to make the patient abandon the people or food or books he really likes in favor of the best people, the right food, the important books. I've known a human defended from strong temptations to social ambition by a still stronger taste for tripe and onions. It remains to consider how do we can retrieve this disaster. The great thing is to prevent him from doing anything. As long as he does not convert into action, it does not matter how much he thinks about this new repentance. Let the little brute wallow in it. Let him, if he has any bent that way, write a book about it. That's often an excellent way of sterilizing the seeds which the enemy plants in the human soul. Let him do anything but act. No amount of piety in his imagination and affections will harm us if we can keep it out of his will. As one of the humans have said... Active habits are strengthened by repetition, but passive ones are weakened. The more often he feels without acting, the less he will be able ever to act, and in the long run, the less he will be able to feel. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape. Thanks. We'll see you next time.